So now we're ready to start after two hours of sleep. Thanks to you guys, by the way, it was an awesome night. <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. Krakow is an amazing city. It's my first time in Poland. I really love it. It's really great here. Thanks for having me and thanks um, for the warm welcome here on the, the conference as well. As he was saying already, my name is Sebastian Kister. I have been actually a teacher, uh, a musician, an author. Um, I publicated in um, various um, scientific magazines. Um, but now I am a team lead of the Kubernetes Competence Center at Audi, and we're doing a uh, transformation um, project by project. We're creating germ cells. Um, that gather a critical mass until they can absorb culturally. Uh, my focus is always on people first, then tech, and then processes. But, um, yeah, before Audi, I was in like a decade in startups, and we've created uh, an IPTV solution uh, from first customer to 1.25 million customers. Um, you have orange here. It's blue in Germany, by the way. It's O2. Um, and before that, I was uh, in a privacy by design startup, driven by a very purposeful mission of privacy on the internet. But nobody cared. So it was a B2B business very quickly. Um, let me tell you about uh, what we are doing at Audi. I mean, for decades, Audi built breathtaking premium vehicles. And our goal is to transfer this customer excitement, this customer experience that you have in the, in the classical engineering world to a digital service portfolio. And you, you get it. How do we achieve this coming from three to five year product cycles in the modern software world? It's not possible. So um, what we need to do is um, make a core competence out of adaptability. Adapting, reacting, acting fast is the core competence. And um, the entire automotive industry uh, is part of, a, I would rather say, radical change. Um, we have sustainability in the core values. We have to fight climate change even by front-end changes on just make, make it a dark background just to save energy, you know. Um, or in clouds, uh, the, the challenges are very obvious if you use like the entire cluster all the time or if you idle it. And there are significant game changes and the Audi Group is in the process of redefining itself um, to lead that process. And uh, we want to have the instrumental role in shaping the transformation as we head into this well-known new age of mobility. And that's why it's uh, saying unleash the beauty of sustainable mobility. And in the context of our session, um, it's consistently customer, people first. Um, let's say to be uh, in customer experience and fasci fascinating customer relevant innovation, um, it doesn't work anymore with engineering. You put out a car and it's done. You have to push something into the car. Um, you have so many great features in autonomous driving that you can uh, test over the air, for example you can have a full-blown platform, as a, like, like a mobile phone. It's an IoT device in the end, a car. It has several SIM cards, many connectivity things. And the, like I said before, the capability to adapt quickly um, and to have the customer excitement in the car is our core competence. And that applies to people as well as to companies. So this high degree of flexibility is important for companies to participate in defining the speed at which new technologies are developed, are accepted, and are rolled out. And we have not been ahead in the last decade. 
We have a very late cloud journey. We started with cloud foundations in 2017. And I guess many of you were already developing cloud native back then. And when I joined Audi in 2019, um, I introduced the uh, inner source process to really um, contribute throughout silos to a certain project. And um, I created a partnership with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation in the same year that I'm uh, leading still today, as well as being in the CTO summit um, of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation itself. And um, this open source contribution process is like really key to um, foster innovation and to um, be a, like bleeding edge all the time. Because you have like two, five, t oh, oh, what do you think? How many people do we have focusing on Kubernetes in 2017? Well, I guess it was two actually, yeah. It was one, but he told the other one Kubernetes is really a thing. And then he deep dived into it. So, um, and now we have a competence center. We have 33 platforms, uh, Kubernetes platforms. And uh, that's not even all of them. It's just um, what, you, what you expect. Like we had uh, a wide range of OpenShift platforms, Rancher, KubeADM. We have even a Audi proprietary Kubernetes control plane in 2017. And there was Cloud Foundry, Mesos, EKS, AKS, Cloud Native Services, as you know them. And it was too much. It was just a wild growth of platforms. And everybody was like, yeah, let's try this out. We have to do something here. We have to do something there. Oh, we need a Kubernetes is, a, is good. Like, and they created a Kubernetes platform out of the necessity to run one app. And that happened. So um, what we did is like um, take all these platforms and put them uh, into a, well, let's say competence center with a governing um, and consulting uh, role. And now we are actually merging platforms and we have end of life of platforms as well. So in German, it's called Abschaltinitiative, which means just kill it and see what happens. And what, if, what are we doing um, in terms of uh, security? Because runtime today is a commodity. I don't want to spend my time with managing the runtime. I mean, spinning up a cluster is like, it, sh it should not even bother me. I don't care. It should just be there. So 95% um, of what we are doing is investing in security. Our USP is like container security, uh, ingress security. It's all about interface security. And uh, it's preemptive security. It has a lot of shift left. And um, obviously, uh, the attack vectors are various. But usually nobody steals data. Nobody wants, we, we have an ingress of like, I don't know, 12 petabytes a day, the Audi fleet. So if somebody steals the data, we would like offer him a shitload of money to um, process it for us and we get the results back. Um, so attacks on infrastructure is like the biggest one. We have like these Bitcoin miners on our infrastructure that really want to hijack infrastructure. That is the biggest attack vector, actually. And um, to fence that off, uh, we have multiple things to look at. And that's why I uh, want to talk to you about how does it look like in Audi? How does it look like in a huge enterprise? Obviously, you have developers. You have the guy in the middle. The guy in the middle is like, he's the process guy. He sometimes doesn't even know what he's responsible for. We call this the responsibility uh, competence gap. 
And he's basically shoveling money from left to right, but he's very good at that. And then we have an operations team, obviously. The responsibilities are, it's quite easy. Developers create code, create great apps, great products. And uh, sometimes they know where it will be operated, but sometimes they don't. They just create something, they're creative about it, they have something, and then they're like, oh yeah, let's run it. Let's put it to production. And then there's the guy in the middle and the operations team, and they're like, no, your container has root. You, we don't allow root. And that's where this starts. You have specifications and hand over protocols. It's a plan build run organization in the end, right? It's with silos. And specification handover through what I call friction walls. It creates so tremendous amount of friction. Um, just imagine the guy in the middle like, is on holidays, can't hand over something, and you have a time to market that is horrible. It takes sometimes six months to put something into production. Um, you have tools over there, uh, obviously, like continuous integration platforms. We have, by the way, even too many of those. But um, project management tools, platform tools, whatever. There is so much um, tech that can actually be learned by the developers as well. So there is a thing, the gray area here is terms and conditions, it's SLAs. This is like contracts. People have a contract, they sign an SLA, and then this is like for sure, this is your responsibility. The operations team operates the infrastructure. But what they also can do in a non-existing end-to-end responsibility is go to the other end, to the developer. Go to the developer and show them how it's done, how to automate something, how to create a container image properly, how to use the right container image and not download some shit from Docker. And is it a hardened sys benchmarked image? Is it secure? Does it have uh, um, the automated alerting uh, or what? I mean, when you show it to them, they're sometimes really... Um, being able to do this. You enable the developer to automate something with a complete shift left security chain. And what happens is basically still magic for, for big enterprises. They have a time to market of hours. Because, um, for example, with Trivi scans, just to give you an example of many, many shift left technologies, if you have Trivi, and you use it for container image scanning, container runtime scanning. Okay? You're familiar with that, maybe. And the guy here, the developer, can use Trivi already on his local machine with the policies that we will be enforcing in the infrastructure later on. So he knows if it will check out or not before he even bothers the middle guy or the, or the guy in the end. There is no friction anymore. He already has a 100% security of uh, will it be accepted or not. And this, this is like everything that you can pre-program, you can automate. And then you have a shift left automation tool chain from build to ops, to production. And that makes happy users. That makes people passionate about it because they really have a frictionless experience of running something, of creating, of their creation process, of doing continuous integration, although they're in a silo structure. And if you do that, like, you force them into success because you say you can only go into the cluster if you use these kind of tools and um, if you're automated and if you respect the entire shift left chain, but you have to enable them, you have to show them. Because often they have not heard of the tools or they don't know how to use it. And you know yourself sometimes they try something, have a container and say, yeah, who runs it for me? Yeah, nobody wants to run some 
a container that is using the wrong image, that uh, was not respecting the platform rules and whatnot. So we have so many automated alerting, policy enforcements and whatnot on the, on the, on the infrastructure to be secure. Like, like I told you before, 95% of what we're doing is security. And then, once you force them into success, their second project and the third project and the fourth project has the time to market to production in hours, not six months. And then you have happy users. Everybody is like, what, this is amazing. And using these tools, helping each other out, right? If you do that 20 times, you have 20 happy projects. And they're helping each other in a Slack channel. It's like you can write tickets at Audi to Service Center 3. Then there's some guy who has literally no idea what you're talking about, but he will get a ticket and he will be like, yeah, no idea what to do with that, but I'm sending it to, I guess, over there. Then you have a second level support who's like, no idea what that is, but I know the guy who might know. I'm sending it over there. And weeks later, you get a reply. That's not how it works. You have a strong community, fast reacting Slack channel, passionate people that really know what they're talking about, and they have solved the problem before, maybe. But maybe they're just interested in your problem and want to solve it with you. So, passionate people, what are they doing in the end? They're creating great products. Passionate people create great products. And in the end, Audi needs passionate people to create great products. And as a transformation uh, expert or evangelist, as they call it in the CNCF, um, we have something that is called the responsibility competence gap. So you're responsible for something, but you're not really very deep into it. So you have like a new challenge over there. And the deeper you dive into a topic, if you're re like really making yourself an expert in anything, you will be passionate about it just because you have the depth of knowledge in it. And then you want to share it. And the next keynotes will be deep diving into the responsibility competence gap, just to give you an out outlook to what's coming the rest of the year and the next year, because this touring program is like uh, finished already with uh, transformation and the culture that we impose at Audi. But it is about the people. We put the people first. We give them the tech they need, that they want, to create great products, to be innovative, to be fast, to have a core competence that is adaptability and reacting fast on customer expectations, as I started in the beginning. And you cannot do that with a time to market of six months. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope um, you had some inspiration in it. And uh, unfortunately, I have to catch a flight to Berlin, like right now. And uh, I need to leave because I got the opening keynote tomorrow on the DevOps Summit. And um, just connect on LinkedIn, just write me. This is like a real often. It's not like, yeah, let's connect, I'm never answering anyway. No, really, connect, write, exchange, um, have a call, um, or if you, if you have some input, if you have some exchange, um, or if you want to learn something um, into like one slide, deep diving into that, just reach out. I'm here for you guys. and. I wish you a great conference. I guess you could have uh, maybe a few minutes to answer some questions. Yes. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's have two questions before we have a break. By the way, I really love this idea of killing the system if you don't know if someone uses it. You, yeah. you, you wouldn't you know, believe how many times I heard that someone is using us, we see it in the logs, but we don't know who it is, right? And yeah. whether he really, exactly. really is the system. 
Over there. All right. Uh. Hi, I have a question. Uh, you said that uh, your values are people, tech, and process, right? The priorities, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering why the tech is before process. Like, tech is replaceable. Well, um, the people, the, the people um, need to be enabled in tech. They need to learn how to use the tech that is there to be bleeding edge. Um, they need to be passionate about the technologies to stay bleeding edge. And um, you have to focus on the tech before the process because, um, for example, if you follow the process, you will create terrible tech because the process is 30 years old in Audi. You can't innovate following something that was created to scale organizations 50 years ago. So um, when we used the possibilities of technology and we're, we're like really open-minded with the people that we have and the technology that is out there. And we find something like more uh, effective, a more effective way, but it doesn't follow the process. Then let's adjust the process. Because you created some innovation. If you follow the process first, you will always be in a very, very guardrail zone and you will not be able to escape and innovate. Okay, thanks. All right, anyone else? There is one more. Um, so, good uh, speech and thank you, Sebastian, for the keynote and open. Um, the, the structure you have here is not a traditional DevOps structure because you've got a very defined development team and then sort of a product slash lifecycle team and then an operations team. How do, you, how do you build that ownership in your developers when they don't have to operate and run necessarily the platforms they're building? Come again? So you're not, you're not following the traditional DevOps structure yeah, yeah. of having Dev and Ops in one team. You've got this free exactly. team structure. Uh, and it's one that we're looking at doing at Tesco. So we're very interested how you built that because it's, very, very, it's not the textbook way of doing it in the 2020. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You have, to, you have to work with what's there, actually. So um, your ability to run it um, is a nice philosophy, but just imagine how much infrastructure you need. It doesn't make sense in a company that has 96,000 employees. In VW, we're working with VW Group, but we have 440,000 direct employees and 690,000 in total working in the uh, subsidiaries as well. So there's a tremendous amount of technology going on. So you need kind of like scalability starts with sharing infrastructure. And so you have to... Uh, I mean, think of how many... You, you're recruiting people, right? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I completely get, get you, but it's... The, you it's won't get the people to have a full-blown DevOps structure somewhere. You can have DevOps cells, like, for fast, innovative projects that really want to have a breakthrough, like a POC. DevOps is fine. But really, um, put something into production uh, on a scalable way for, um, like, building 1.5 million cars a year and um, a numerous amount of digital services, this really has to be on platforms like shared infrastructure. And that's, that's just a fact. So you have to work with that. That's one premise. It's, you have platforms to scale, to share economy, all sort of economy. People, money, and EC2. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then on the other hand, um, you want to be fast. So you need to enable them, uh, the, dev the developer, on the one operational infrastructure that is there, ideally. Obviously, there's more. Um, but that's how you do... It's kind of a DevOps without being in one team. It's a silo-based DevSecOps, you could say. Okay. So is, is that where really that lifecycle team comes in to 
do you take something from like a spike and then lifecycle it into a platform or? No, this lifecycle is referring to actually um, inner processes. It's just um, to be in the right tools, to be in the budgetary plans, to be in life cycling and application is not a technical thing, it's a um, self-governing uh, process related thing uh, in the organization to be um, present in the organization in all of the steering committees and stuff. Thank you very much, Sebastian. We'd love to talk more about this as well. Thank you.